Good afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of Entrepreneurship Matters. My name is Alicia Wilson. I'm Vice President for Economic Development for Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins Health System. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the most poetic Entrepreneurship Matters that we have ever had. Um, I have two amazing poets, artists, um, performers, dancers, educators on today, and you are in for a treat. Let me invite Nia June and Slangston Hughes onto the screen as I give you their bios and set us up for another amazing uh, conversation. So we know the successful businesses, successful entrepreneurs, successful people are built in a day. It takes a lot of hard work, a long-term commitment, multiple failures to make it happen. And these two entrepreneurs are no different. Um, they are the leaders in their craft. Um, you're going to know why. And um, we are just so honored to have them here today. Let me first introduce Nia June. Nia is a Baltimore native, published poet, filmmaker, performer, dancer, arts and educator, and author of Paper Trails of the Undying. In 2020, she was recognized by Baltimore Magazine, listen to this, as the best poet of Baltimore. Her directorial debut of Black Girls Country featured in national and international film festivals and was recently acquired by the Baltimore Museum of Art as a part of their permanent collections. Huge, huge. Nia serves her community as an arts educator, teaching dance, film, and creative writing to Baltimore youth. Her most recent film, The Unveiling of God, a love letter to my forefather made its premiere in Baltimore in October, 2021. The film illustrates black men in the community through moving portraits, poetry, dance, and music. June is a proud member of the Baltimore community and it shows at the center of her work. We're gonna talk a little bit about that as well, like highlighting Baltimore, love it. Well, welcome Nia, so glad to have you today. And let me, uh, Victor, Victor Rogers, but most of us know him as Slankston Hughes. Um, I'm so pleased to have him on. Is a national slam champion based out of Baltimore, Maryland. Artistic director of Do More Baltimore and lead coach of the two-time world champion. Get that, world champion Baltimore City youth poetry team, as well as the author of the poetry collection, Slanguage, Arts, and Griot glimpses and forthcoming book God's favorite breakdance move um, he is um, um, one of the last poets um, that um, one of the great poets and has had so many critical acclaim all across uh, the country so Slankston welcome um, I'm going to do a number of different projects with Slankston so it's an honor to have him on as well why don't we get right into this conversation around you two are artists and we have not had as many artists on. Um, and so it's interesting for people to hear about how do you, what inspired you to, you know, turn what could have been, you know, something that you would do on the side as your life's work. So what drew you to being entrepreneurs in the art field? So I'll start with Nia and then go to Slankston. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, so I come from a dance background. So I started, I've been dancing my whole life. I didn't start taking writing seriously until um, my father passed away in 2017. And it really was just a matter of me finding out what my purpose was. Like I realized that this was my calling in life. And um, it was the most authentic language for me, even though I had spent my entire life dancing, it was me being my truest self whenever I was writing or performing. And I think that when you figure that out, you really can't shy away from that. You can't deny it. You can't run from it because it will always find you in some kind of way. So from there, um, you know, I really used that platform I had to, again, speak out about Baltimore. That's one of my biggest inspirations because growing up here, you know, you kind of learn to hate the place. You think it's like this mean, like grimy place. And, you know, a lot of people want to leave. They want to find something that's more refreshing. But poetry 
helped me find the beauty in Baltimore. That's where my inspiration comes from. And just turning that into my life's work was easy from there. And I think that, you know, I have a great community. There's a strong arts community here. When I first got on the scene, there were people like Slinkston and Black Chakra um, and so many others who uh, recognized my talent and also took me under their wing, but also people I can look up to and see who's done this before, like who's dedicated their life to something that people would consider a risk or, you know, just a hobby. Excellent. Excellent. Love that. And I, I love how you said it allowed for you to be your truest self. Um, and in and, and Baltimore, you got to see the beauty of Baltimore through it. Beautiful, beautifully said. How about you, Slankson? How did you come to realize this was going to be your life's work and come to realize that this was, um, you know, not your, just your vocation, but sort of your evocation? Um, I could talk about that for an entire webinar in itself, um, just in terms of how, you know, there's always the, the, the myth of the, and sometimes the truth of the starving artist, like, mm -hmm. you know, go and do art, be prepared to be broke and hungry. Um, and uh, along the journey, that is absolutely a fact. Um, but, um, just yesterday, I was a part of um, a workshop session um, that we were talking all about the budget, the budget for your big thing you want to do as an artist. And, and like, how do you approach the financial aspect of it in a way that mm -hmm. is functional? And it, we were talking really a lot about dispelling this whole idea, this whole notion that often people outside of the arts world will kind of project like, oh, you're an artist, well, we can only give you this much, or, well, can you just do it and we'll work it out along the way? It's like, you know, if someone hires a catering company, they're not gonna try to jip the catering company on the event because people got to have their cheese sandwiches and they cucumbers for the event. Like, but then if they hire a poet to come do a poem, it's like, well, you know, we give you this much of the, we don't got much of the budget. Like, we got budget for the caterer. You expect that the, the artist is supposed to, you know, not get paid. Like, and so there's this, this expectation that the artist is expected to be starving um, forever. Like, that's just how it works. And so I think first and foremost is like kind of like changing that mentality. Yeah. To like your art and more importantly, you, what you bring, your skills and your talents as an artist are just as valuable and just as worthwhile um, for money to be put into it as someone who is creating scaffolding for the side of a building for the city or whatever else it is. Um, and so and so for me, there never really was like any moment along the way where I was like, this is it, I'm gonna do art. Like, I didn't really decide that, like it more so chose me from really very on. Mm -hmm. um, but then the decision that I did make um, once I started college was like, okay, I want to do something that feeds what I want to do which is yeah. the, the part of me that is all of me, which is the artist part. Um, and so I, I decided when I got to college that like I wanted my major to match my passion. Um, and so I started off as an English arts and, and a media major um, and shout out to Coppin State University. And along the way, um, that particular major at the time at Coppin just really was having a difficult time like maintaining a certain level and it wasn't aligned with what I wanted to do. Um, and so um, a new major came about in the Coppin was one of the first universities to do it called urban arts production, but like you literally get trained in producing art, specifically urban arts. Um, and so I switched my major way, way, way into the process. I was like, this, this is really what I want to do. This matches this is in alignment with what I actually want to do way more than this other thing. And so I was like way into it and still switched and it took a lot longer to finish. Um, and so um, it, it was a great choice though. It made all the difference and, and not because of, of the academic aspect of it as much as the networking part of it. Um, yeah. And really in Coppin in general, like help connect me to all of these things. And so that for me was the decision to be like, you know, even after making the decision to pursue that aspect um, of who I was through art, um, through my academics, even making the other decision to be like, well, this aspect of that aspect is way more aligned with what I want to do. Um, and so it was more so not a change of the path, but more so like I need a different I need a different kind of gas. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think you said something really, really important for folks to be 
especially those who are on here who are saying, how can I, um, how can I work with you and partner, which is this myth of the starving artist, um, that there is a, um, that you all should be paid and well compensated for, for your work, um, and that it is a business, um, just like any other business, um, and that you are bringing your heart and your talent to it, but it is a business. So I'd like to pivot to the question of how did you begin it into a business? So we have poets watching today. We have other artists and they're saying, you know, I, I don't have, it's not a business for me. I don't even know how I would get the money other than under the table. So how did you make that shift into really creating and becoming an entrepreneur in this? So I'll start with you, Nia, and then Slanks, then love to get your comments as well. So the first thing for me was defining myself. And I think that that's a step that gets overlooked for artists because we think, you know, I'm just a creative. I do all of these things, but I had to really sit with myself and understand what it is that I offer and, you know, what services I would like to provide and figure out, like Slankston said, you know, we have to decide what our art is worth so many times because we have to pick a budget and um, sitting down and understanding what is required of me in order to create, you know, mm -hmm. how long do these things take for me? And um, how important is this to me? So I had to make like a, an outline, like a mini business plan for myself to understand myself mm -hmm. as an artist on paper. Um, then from there, I think that branding was a big part of, of my process. And I did this on my own. But also it's, you know, as an artist, it really is hard to put, not necessarily put yourself in a box, but, you know, not sell yourself, but create some sort of image and overall feeling that you're giving people with your work. So that was a step that I took, understanding, you know, what kind of emotion I want people to feel when they think about my work and, you know, what is a common signature, a common theme that I offer. And then from there, just constantly educating myself and getting into uh, spaces with people who um, may not also be in my field and understanding like what that cross functionality looks like. So talking to people who, who in the restaurant industry or people who are in the financial industry, just taking, pulling from as many areas as I can and applying it to, to myself as an artist. And again, that networking piece was one of the most important things. Um, just making sure that I'm constantly opening myself up to new opportunities and um, just learning about how to, because it's different when you're not like a big corporation or an industry or you don't have a brick and mortar, you are the mm -hmm. business. So <laughs> that networking piece is important so that I'm constantly learning how to make sure that everything is legit and mm -hmm. that it's, and also keeping that balance between legitimacy and creativity, right? Because you don't want to be too businessy as an artist. You still want to be able to um, have that creative um, aspect be at the center. Um, so that that was it for me. I just really tried to educate myself and make sure that I understand what it is that I am bringing so that there's never any shying away from what my budget is or trying to sell myself short because I know what it is that I have to offer. Yeah, no, you you gave, I wrote down seven gems that you said in that and just giving us that. So let me take it first. First, you talked about you defined yourself. So what do you offer? What are the services you and really not boxing yourself in, but really what is the catalog uh, that you are going to offer? Second is that you really focused on, you know, what, what are you like trying to quantify it? So if I'm gonna offer these services, what's the, what's the quantify, how do you quantify that? Third, you talked about branding and really focusing on, so how am I going to project on to the world the fifth, fourth, fifth was educating yourself in a number of different ways by just the craft, but also cross functionality. So who also could you be aligned with? Uh, six about networking. So you went deep on that, really thinking about, you know, you are the business. You know, you don't have a cupcake. You don't have a plant. You don't have an, you are the business. And so really being that. And then really striking that balance between creativity, legitimacy, recognizing to have, you know, it is a business, but the creative, the creative is what drives it. And so I took down seven points and no others may have taken down eight or six, but um, those are what we took away from you on, on that point. Really, really great gems. How about you, Slankston? How did you, 
think about the business part of it and how did you start? What were the steps you went through? I tell you what, it was um, it was a long and um, arduous journey, really, honestly. Um, I think the first moment that I remember was I was maybe in between freshman and sophomore year and I was like sitting in the car with my mother at the Greyhound station, either being picked up or on the way back to school um, under a bridge in Pittsburgh where this Danky Greyhound station was at. And I was just like, I don't know how I'm going to be an adult. Like, like I don't want to, I don't want to do something that I hate just to make money. Like I want to like, I want to be able to sustain myself by doing something that is fulfilling, that is pursuing my passion and being an artist. And, you know, a lot of parents might be like, well, you know, life is tough and art ain't going to mm-hmm. give you no food on the table. You need to go ahead and work a job that's going to make you some money. But I have a very different mother and she was like, you don't have to do that. Like, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. Like, you don't have to do anything like that. Like, there are so many different avenues and so many paths that you can pursue where your passion and your job can be the same thing. And it's like, uh, uh, I can. <laughs> so, and so, like, that was kind of the first moment where it was like, it really kind of sank in that, like, there is another path other than what you think is, like, the only path that is is the, the predictable societal, like, narrative. Um, and then another moment that stands out is, like, years later, like, deep into the struggle of making this a reality, like, I remember I was just like, oh, I don't quite know what is next. Like, I'm really broke. Um, and I remember I, I called my aunt who um, was like kind of like my second mother who I lived with while I was going to Coppin. Um, and I was just like, I need just like $200 so that I can press up some of these CDs and then I'm going to just build it from there. Like, I'm just going to go to events. I'm going to do these features. Mm-hmm. Like, if I could just get enough to print up this amount of CDs, this, this amount of CDs, like that can be like the seed for whatever comes after, but I just need a seed investment. She was like, okay, um, I believe, I believe you can do it. And so it's like, that was kind of like the beginning of being like, poetry is going to be the vehicle that um, I find a way to utilize. And then another moment that stands out is um, a mentor of mine, um, um, hip hop producer from Baltimore, Sean Soray. We used to have like these four or five hour long conversations about you name it. And I remember, again, I was just like, yo, like, I don't know how to make this work right now. Like, I, do, I, I want to I want to put my art out there, but how do I finance it? Like, and he was like, you know, you cannot think like with tunnel vision, you can't just be like, okay, I got the art now. How do I make the art make money? It's like, you have to find a way to produce as many streams of revenue as you possibly can in order to fund the thing that you really want to be the thing. Um, and, and that was a big moment because it made me start to think about being an artist in different ways than just being an artist. It's like, what are other ways that you can tap into resources? What are other streams of revenue that when you're doing this, you're not thinking, okay, this is something I'm doing right now and I'm putting the art on the side. It all should be a part of propelling the art forward how did you finance it with multiple streams of revenue and so i think like those kind of like were the three big moments for me like along the journey of like oh there is another path Mm -hmm. oh i can find a way to do it if i reach out to others and be like hey this is i just need this springboard and then don't think one dimensional about it like what are multiple ways that you can you can Feed the baby. No, no. I think you you gave so many great points. Again, so many comp. Let me tell people how they can participate because I see you all already participating. Put your questions in the chat on Zoom. Put them on Facebook in the chat, and also text them two two three three three. Text J H U W L in the message, and I'll get all those questions. You made really three great points, and I'm thankful to your mom, your aunt and to uh, your mentor for really uh, motivating you in many respects. I think one really, really great that you talked about coming to the realization that you wanted to do something fulfilling. 
rather than being stuck in your mom and family being supportive of that. Really critical for those of us who are in the, in the position to dash or allow for dreams to flourish, um, that she affirmed you in that moment. The second, the, um, the seed funding, and, and all of our entrepreneurs talk about the seed funding that they need for, for business. And then three really important point I thought you'd made, which was around producing as many streams of revenue to support your craft rather than thinking, you know, it doesn't matter where the money comes from. It really is, is, is a stream of revenue that supports you in doing the work that you want to do rather than making the art and thinking and then coming up with a way to support the art through the art. And so I thought that was really helpful for so many. We're getting a lot of, we're getting a lot of questions in. Um, and I'm going to let this question be the next one, which is um, one that someone just posed, which is, how did you think about, and I'm going to start with you, so thanks, then I'm going to go to Nia. How did you think about, and we got this question in the chat, which is, how did you think about the multiple streams of revenue that you would ultimately utilize to be a part of your whole portfolio of supporting your art? So how did you, what, what were the things you thought about and what did you, what was on the table as a stream of revenue? So um, a lot of it was kind of like thinking outside the box in terms of different things that I could do. Like, so um, early on, the very first teaching job I got was um, right after my freshman year at Coppin. And again, it came so much from the networking that happened <laughs> on campus than just the academic part. Um, a professor saw me perform somewhere and then was like, someone was looking for a poetry teacher to teach this summer program. And that's what happened. Like mm -hmm. that was the very beginning. I was like 19 years old. Um, and it started right there just because somebody saw me performing mm -hmm. somewhere. And so a lot of times it is really just putting yourself out there in as many places as possible. Um, and then that can lead to different aspects of revenue outside of just what you do while you're doing your art. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and then other ways was early on, um, I taught photography, I, I taught film, like it was different ways. It's like, what are other ways outside of just my primary artistic discipline that create revenue through the arts? And then sometimes it's not directly through the arts at all. Like um, sometimes it's a lot of times it's applying for grants, um, sometimes that align with something you're trying to do, sometimes completely different. And you find a way to rob Peter to pay Paul. <laughs> like, it was like, for instance, um, I did AmeriCorps for like two years. Technically, while you're doing AmeriCorps, you're not supposed to be doing any other side, anything that you get paid for. Um, they don't know that when you're doing it. And when they tell you that at the symposium that you go to for like all the new AmeriCorps people in the Eastern region, they even say it kind of like, you're not supposed to do this. So if you do this, you know, don't, you know, tell us that you're doing this. And it's like, yeah, like, of course, like, of course, there's going to be other opportunities happening outside of when you're doing that thing. And it's like, how many things can you bring into the thing that you are really trying to make the thing? Um, and so um, a lot of times it is like thinking outside the box in terms of like, okay, here's this pot of money right here. I need this money to be over here for this thing that I'm doing this project. How can I be creative about thinking how the finances can work on multiple levels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And really having a plan, which is what I, I heard you saying, like, how are you going to cobble it all together? I think great. Nia, how about you? Same, similar path? How did you think about this? Yeah, yeah, really similar. Flankston really said it all. You, you just have to get creative. The same way you're creative with the way you create, get creative in thinking about um, what you offer. And what I mentioned before about defining what it is you offer in all your services, um, that helps just figuring out what it is that you're good at and what you feel is valuable. And a lot of times it's really hard to do that for yourself because you think, oh, I can just help this person out. But again, you don't want to be a starving artist. You have to recognize your worth. And sometimes you have people around you who help you do that. Like people will come to you and say, hey, can you do this? What's your fee? And you're like, oh, I didn't know I could charge for this thing, <laughs> you know? So just um, that's what I did. And 
I do more was the first um, organization that I taught with I didn't realize that I could teach poetry when they asked me and it's something I've been doing since then. I mentioned that I used to dance so I teach dance at studios. Um, I've been hired to direct music videos to edit books like these are things that I didn't even initially think about but again putting yourself in the right place where some people also see your value and want to pay you for it. So again, just get creative and know your worth. Those are the biggest things. Excellent. Excellent. And both of you talked about in your in your in this conversation about how mentors have played a role in your development as artists, but your development as business individuals, your personal development. So this question came in on Facebook, which is how has mentorship impacted your career, whether being a mentor or finding mentors? And how did you go about really building a set of people, mentors that would, you know, pour into you, but you'd also mentees that you pour into. So Nia, I'll start with you and then, and then let's thanks then. Okay. Um, yeah, so I was fortunate enough to find a mentor as soon as I started um, here in Baltimore. Uh, Black Chakra started, he used to have this coffee and critiques thing at Peace in a Cup of Joe and you would just bring a poem. So I was very nervous um, I, to put it on the stage. So I showed up to this thing because I've been watching Black Chakra for a while. And, um, you know, he loved the poem and he really started to, from there, just stay in communication with me, bring me out to open mics, continuously put me in rooms. He would um, coach me, give me opportunities. And he really just kept me going by constantly reminding me of my value until I was able to see it for myself. And that really, really helped me. Like, I honestly don't, I don't think I would be where I am without having that push and that support from him and from a lot of the people um, in Do More Baltimore. And then mentors just kept popping up. One of my biggest two mentors right now is uh, Kirby Griffin and Sharena Ashanti Christmas. Uh, I met, I, I've worked with Kirby since I met him. We've uh, worked with films together. And again, he saw my talent in directing and just offered this um the support, you know, during the pandemic, he would stop by my house and drop off like a stack of movies, a stack of DVDs just for me to study. And um, it's just always stuff like that. He's always um, putting information in my ear and um, thinking of me for opportunities. And the same thing with Sharena Ashanti Christmas. I teach for her organizations now. And just seeing them pour into me naturally, I, I pour it back out to the youth mm -hmm. in my community. There are so many um, youth that I work with now you know, whenever they text me, I'm there for them, whatever they need, because I understand the importance of that. You know, you can't just, we can all wing it, but as a community, especially as Black people, that's so imperative that we help one another. I mean, it's as simple as that. And it's like, why would I just have all of this knowledge and not want to share it and spread it to someone who was like me a few years ago? Um, mentorship yeah. is like number one for me as far as just being an artist. I feel like it's a requirement. No, no, I love it. I love it. And like I said, I've gotten to work with many of the young people you've gotten to mentor. Um, but can you talk about mentoring for, for you? How has that played a role? I mean, people are wondering how is it and how did you acquire your mentors? Are you on mute? I think really it starts with um, a lot of times us as artists, especially us Virgo artists, like we we have this assumption that like we got to do it all on mm -hmm. like we, we got to just make it happen and there's no such thing as that like especially in art especially in entrepreneurship like there's no such thing as doing it on your own like there's always you always need a team you always need a foundation you always need people to help guide you in the right direction um it's so important um mentors are so important in that you can't do it on your own and you do need you do need help um it does take a village, like emphatically so. Um, and for me, like it goes all the all the way back to like the beginning. Really, um, I had really amazing black teachers um, along the way um, who made it possible for me to even exist in this world as um, as a black man and as at the time as a young black boy who was just like dealing with a lot. Um, and so there were early on there were teachers. Um, who identified like a particular kind of skill and was mm -hmm. like, you know, I know, you know, you're dealing with a lot, but I see that you know, you know how to write and you know how to say your words out loud. Um, there was a teacher um, 
Tom McClowski, who um, is now the principal of like the school that I went to, my high school in Pittsburgh. And um, and he was just, you know, a English teacher at the time, white guy who was a hip hop head. And was like, you know, we don't have a creative writing class. And like, I see that like, this is something that you're really passionate about. And he created a creative writing class. It was only like me oh, and wow. three other students. Oh, wow. um, and then um, the teacher, um, Miss Perry, um, who passed this year, um, rest in peace, Miss Perry. Uh, it's so important for there to be black teachers that young black students see, mm -hmm. and it, it it validates your existence at times when you don't yeah. think you are worthy of existing. Um, yeah. And uh, I remember Miss Perry being one of those people, the history teacher and the dean of students, taught my mother and my aunt too, who was there for thirty nine years, and like her impact is astronomical like astronomical um and then like coming to baltimore um and just like doing everything i could to integrate myself into the scenes like i remember I was, like at the end of one semester i was like I gotta make sure i get enough money together financial aid help from my aunt like so that i can come back to baltimore next semester so that i can go to these open mics <laughs> like like all these events are popping up i gotta get to these microphones and then like there being people who saw me and was like you know there's really something special there um, want to reach out and be like, here's some things you could do to be better. And here's some things you're doing really good. Um, and so I remember, uh, Ooh, from Brown Fish, rest in peace. Ooh, um, saw me at a poetry slam. Um, it was like a collegiate poetry slam. And he was just like, yo, you're like a lyrical beast. <laughs> it was like, like, what, who are you? Like we're in either poet MC, um, it's the same event. And was just like, whatever you just did, I need to put that on stages and other places. Um, and so for me, the, I had just like a lot of raw ability, but there was people who saw me and was like, yeah. you know, if you hone that a certain way, it can actually, it can actually transcend just being good on the open mic. Um, Lamar Hill saw me um, at an event competing in a slam against him, actually. Um, I got crushed and he was like, you know, come to my event. And it's like a real easy, audience for you to just jump right on stage and people will immediately recognize that you're doing something different from everybody else. Like, you know, come to this event, you don't have to pay, just come and, I'll, and uh, I guarantee you a spot to perform. And so it's like people recognizing something special um, in you and, and, and reaching out is such an important thing. And then um, um, for me, where it really goes even even further is the importance of of that torch pass, that, that village wide torch pass of like, for those of us who have been mentored to become mentors. Um, Cause I know for me, you know, or especially early on with those teachers, like that was something that was so essential to just my my life and, and navigating a lot of difficult things as a, as a, as a youth. Yeah. And so for me, it's, it's, it's imperative that I do the same, um, that I'm not just being handed the torch that I'm handed it on because, you know, this is all nothing if um, we don't pass it down to the next generation because you know we're only here for a snapshot so somebody has to somebody has to complete the picture beautifully said and i loved how both of you just talked about this like um this oblig you know it was put on you an obligation to to make sure that it it continues and and i i wrote that as part of my using that speech uh, you know continue to uh, remind you of the value until you could see it. Um, and I thought that was just a beautiful point. And so getting to uh, a question that is um, someone typed in on text on poll everywhere. The question is when you talked about, you know, the difference between, you know, your craft and legitimacy and creativity, they really wanted you to expound on that. How can people best cultivate their creative talents without jeopardizing them to make a profit. Because I'm guessing that people, you know, we had filmmakers on yesterday, you could draw, you could follow the money or you could follow your creativity. And, you know, I see artists all the time who you're like, whoa, that really shifted in what they're, you know, that's like not the same person. So how do you stay true to your core and to your work into your creativity without, you know, jeopardizing that. Nia, I'd love to start with you in this Langston. Um, I say always be more human than brand. 
Um, because I feel like, at least for me, when I lose sight of my core values, then the creativity is no longer um, stable for me. And there have been plenty of opportunities, and this can go in many ways. So a lot of times when we think about business, uh, what I think about is like mass production, like always having a product <laughs> and content and pushing, like that's the world we live in. But um, again, you have to put yourself first. So there have been situations where someone will ask me to do something, they'll give me a really tight deadline, or maybe on a topic that I don't necessarily believe in. So mm -hmm. I have to make the decision um, about what's more important to me. I understand that I do have to eat, but I feel like when I remain true to myself, the money will follow. Yeah. And that's, again, that's the most important thing. And it's also recognizing um, when you don't have the energy to be a brand, that's okay because you're a human. At the end of the day, it's the person. People, you are a business, but it's the person that makes the art. It's the heart that makes the art. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's your emotion that drives that. And if that's not there, then, you know, it's, you're jeopardizing everything, in my opinion. So again, making, being able to make those hard decisions and again, bringing back in mentors, a lot of them have helped me understand, you know, when it's time to say no. And that's an opportunity to pass it on to somebody else, to give someone else an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I can't do this, but I know someone where this is more aligned to what they do. Maybe they have the time to do it, but um, it's, it's a tough decision to make when you have to eat, but in the long run, um, in the long term, you are jeopardizing something greater. Mm -hmm. oh. No, so, 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 so true. How about you, Thanks, and how do you, how would yeah. you respond? Um, I mean, what Nia said, that last part right there, just exclamation point, like in the long run, you jeopardize something greater, but it's going to be hard. Like, plain and simple, like it's going to be hard, and you have to accept that and be prepared to deal with the impact of that. Um, like, as I'm like, telling a lot of these stories and anecdotes like in a conversation like it's easy for it to kind of get glossed over like yeah this happened and that was difficult and then this happened later but no like when it was happening it was really hard like expletive 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 hard <laughs> like like and um I'm like like right during the beginning of the pandemic um one day my sister my youngest sister who had just graduated from college as the pandemic was happening and it was just like just graduated now pandemic and, and she just called me crying like like she had just started this like virtual telemarketing job that was just two days in it was like sucking her soul <laughs> and she was just like I can't do this like I cannot do this like like how have you been able to like still do like what you want to do like as a person and not have to do something you hate and still survive and I was just like I was like let me tell you about a time I was at the Greyhound station with mom and <laughs> but then came the part of was like but then when you do that when you make that decision you have to understand it's going to be hard like it's going to be very difficult and there could have been an easier way but you have to ask yourself as a person as an individual like what is worth more to me and what is the thing that will be worse for me will it be yeah. worse for me to have my soul sucked while I do this thing to get the material stuff that I need to survive in life? Or will it be better to go through the struggle and then at the end actually have fulfillment from doing the thing that fulfills my soul and does not suck my soul? And it, if to some people, it seems like an easy answer one way or the other, depending on the person. But you have to make that ultimate decision. And you have to realize that if you decide this, like it's going to be difficult. It's, it, it's like, it's like having an out of body, an out of body near death experience, mm -hmm. metaphorically speaking, where like you are looking at your body and a person that you recognize from your life who has passed on to the beyond comes and tells you like, you can come with me and it's going to be great here in the ethereal afterlife of warmth and, and, and wonderfulness, or you can go back and spend more time with the people you really want to spend time with, get back in your body and it's going to hurt really bad, but it's going to be worth it because of the people you love. Like that's a real story that actually happened to someone <laughs> that who is a parent of a student who was in do more years ago and is a science book writer, like a best-selling writer of oh, science. Wow. But like, it was like, you have to decide what really matters to you. Like, and like, that's a bit of an extreme metaphor. Some might say, but like it really is like that level of a decision for like you as an individual. Like, is it worth the pain for what I love 
or not. And like yeah. only you can answer that for yourself. And then it really does, like not only does it take a village, like it takes a tribe within that village. It's like you really gotta find your tribe. And and I think for, for me, like that is really what Do More really became to be um, because I was already doing that kind of work with a yeah. lot of those same people. And then um, shout out to Kenneth Something who co-founder of Do More was just like, you know, not only do we need a way to pass this on to the youth, but we also need a way for like what we're doing as individuals to matter, like for it to matter in terms of impact, but for us not to be like just out here starving. Like, and early on in Do More was the sacrifice part. Like, like I was doing poetry workshops in my basement and like, and took that team to nationals and, and made it all the way to semifinals and top 10, like in our, in our first year of existence and do more and um, but like the sacrifice part was like hey we gonna practice in this flooded basement um i got some 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 save a lot bologna in the refrigerator like don't eat all my turkey bologna then they did and and so it's like it's not just the torch passing aspect but also it's like how do you heat your own house with the torch and like as yeah. artists how do we come together and how do we find our tribe um and then i remember it's at one point in do more Kenneth promised me, he was like, hang in here with us for two years. And I promise you that by that point, this will be something that you can do as your job. And 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 he, he, he kept his promise. It took maybe a little bit longer than two years, but he kept his promise. Um, and and this year is, is Do More's 10th anniversary. Um, so, oh, that's so um, wonderful. That is gotta, so gotta wonderful. Find your tribe. You gotta find your huge, tribe. Huge, huge. That's a huge accomplishment. Don't let that go by. That was a that was a short statement, but huge. And someone asked us on, on Facebook, could we talk a little, could Langston talk a, more about Do More Baltimore and your current programming that's available and let people know about what you're doing? Um, it's tremendous. Um, so can you talk about that? Right. So when I think about 10 years of Do More, I, it, it simultaneously makes me feel um inspired and old at the same time um it's like 10 years just goes by until you start to think about all of the things um and so we are doing a whole lot of stuff in connection to the um 10 year anniversary and it's also you know challenging because you know we're still in the midst of the pandemic you know there's fluctuations and variations and so trying to figure out what are we doing both in person and how can we start to do stuff um virtually now that can transition into in person so starting today we're actually doing a weekly youth um writing workshop um every thursday from six to eight um virtually um and you can you go to our facebook page or our website or our instagram um facebook do more baltimore instagram at do more poetry um you can see how youth can register for that and how they can attend um and then we had doing the festival in April. We had we didn't do a festival for the last two years for obvious reasons. So the festival is fingers crossed is coming back. Um, it's going to be all in one location at Baltimore Design High School. Um, and um, within the festival, we're probably most likely we're going to do a youth poet laureate event, um, which is what we do once a year in connection with the mayor's office to decide the youth poet laureate um, of Baltimore, um, our youth grand slam, the decides youth poetry team. Um, and then we also, real soon, our youth and our summer program this past summer um, created a poetry documentary um, called Say It Loud. Um, and we're doing a virtual screening for that, um, most likely in April as well as part of National Poetry Month. Um, so those are the things like on the immediate horizon. Um, and if you go to domorebaltimore.org, um, you'll see some of the other stuff. Um, but we're just trying to figure out how to, uh, as we've been doing this whole time, keep things moving um at a time when so many things are unable to move no absolutely and everyone i know you probably said i didn't take that all down don't worry we put the links in the chat all of the dot coms and don't worry we're going to give you all of their contact information as we at uh at the close of the show um nia how about you how how have you, um you been able tell us about your work and so the full, I, I don't think I did it justice in uh, in my intro of you, I tried. Um, but the full scope of your work, because you you are an artist in so many different domains. So could you talk a little bit about that and how, how people work with you? 
Yeah, so I do do uh, many things. Um, so the, what I just got into is filmmaking. So that's some of what you touched on in the bio. So I have two films out. One is called A Black Rose Country. It's a film by Kirby Griffin and um, a poet named Nate, another poet in the city helped me direct that film, but I wrote and directed it. And um, it's it's available on YouTube. So please go watch it. It's available for free. Um, say but the name was, again. Say the name again. A Black Girl's Country. Black Girl's Country. Okay, we're gonna yeah. put that in too. I'm gonna put a link Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's a five minute film, very short. And it's about, um, it's just highlighting Black women in Baltimore. I'm saying a poem over it. And then I have Wifty Bangora, who's an amazing singer, come in at the end to give some vocals. Um, and that film was just, a copy of it was purchased by the Baltimore Museum of Art as a part of their permanent collection. So this was pretty huge because um, for one, the Baltimore Museum of Art doesn't have a lot of, artists of color. Yeah. And then having um, local artists, right? So having three, Kirby's from West Baltimore, I'm from West Baltimore, so is Nate. So having three Baltimore natives and Black people um, have a film in that museum forever. And it's about, it's about Black women in Baltimore. So it's like, a, it's such huge. a huge thing Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great. Yeah. And then our second film um, is called The Unveiling of God, A Love Letter to My Forefathers, which is now celebrating Black men. Um, it's a similar approach, but I expounded on it. It's my second piece. Um, so there's a lot more music, a lot more poetry, and it's about 20 minutes long. So that film has not been released yet because we have to go through this long like film festival process. For those of you who know the film industry, you know, it's like a it's a long process where you have to submit to different um, festivals so that your film can be seen by the world because that's what we want. And um, outside of that, I do teach. I teach through uh, Muse 360 Arts, which is a local organization. Um, so this program, New Generation Scholars, it's an African-centered study abroad program. So we work with youth, uh, teaching them many different uh, topics from political education, creative writing, um, photography, dance, all kinds of things. And then we travel. So the kids go to Ghana, Cuba, Puerto Rico. They've been all kinds of places and they study the African diaspora. Um, so that's a heavy part of my work. And then also I have a book out as well. So I'm, I'm really open to working with people. Again, like I said, I've edited books. I'm helping a few artists direct um, their music videos. I'm also working on a documentary for the medicine show that will happen next Thursday or next Wednesday, the 17th, whenever that is. Um, so yeah, I have my hands in a lot of different areas. I also teach dance, but I've worked with people in many ways. So I'm always open to, again, to connect and um, just to figure out ways to spread my energy and my love. But again, I'm uplifting Black people, Black men and women, Black children in Baltimore is like the core of the stuff that I like to work on. Um, so yeah. I hope that answered say, it all. No, it did. I want to make I wanted to make sure everybody understood the full scope of what you and Slankston yeah. do. And I'll, I'll say you, um, it is wonderful to partner with artists because the work that we get to do in you know these brick and mortars, it becomes so much more alive when we have you all as partners. So thank you for what you do. Um, what is um, I have a couple of questions and then I want to make sure Jackie confirms if we have a special guest watching, but this question is coming a couple of times. So I'm going to get it out, get it out of the way, which is who's your favorite artist? So as you think about of all of those who are in, oh, oh, Slanks to game off. Um, you, fans, fans, he's, that's, right. that's such a massive question, but I'll just, I'll just say my favorite poet in the history of earth. Um, and someone who I got to meet several times and was very much a mentor to me as well was a Mary Baraka. Um, so that's my favorite poet in the history of planet Earth, um, for sure. Um, and there's a lot of parallels between the Black arts movement and the things that Do More does today and our summer writing institute, the Maya Baraka Writing Institute, um, a big part of that, um, of why that is. So yeah, Mary Baraka for sure. Oh, love it, love it, love it. Nia, who's your favorite artist? Um, Inazaki Shange is my girl. I love her. She is a, a dancer, a poet, a filmmaker. 
I love her. I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Is Enough, but that is like the catalyst for my work and why I care about the things that I do. Um, she really speaks to me. And another is Spike Lee. I'm a huge Spike Lee fan. I saw him um, not too long ago. Hmm? He comes to Baltimore. He comes to Baltimore all the time. Oh, really? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you where to find them. I'll tell you where to find them. After the show, after the show, after the show. Let, awesome. me, let, <laughs> let me ask you both this question, which is, uh, we, we have confirmed that um, Oprah and a couple other investors are watching. And so the question is, how do we support, not me, I'm not in that group. <laughs> how do you they support? Um, but really, like, really, how do we all support um, entrepreneurs like you, artists like you, to ensure that you um, not only survive, but thrive? Um, and and what, are, what are ways that we can be supportive? So um, thanks, then, and then, Nia. I mean, financial support is something you can never downplay. Um, and we are on Entrepreneurship Matters. So how dare I not say that first? It's like, That's right. Um, say it first. Um, you go to our website, there's definitely a donate button um, through more Baltimore. Um, but and also another way too is networking. Like again, like networking had everything to do with the entire trajectory of teaching that first poetry and hip hop summer program all the way up to now is, is the people that I knew and connected with had more to do with um, what happened when I got to Baltimore than what I learned from a syllabus or what I turned in to the professor like that all matters but if you don't apply it to the real world then it doesn't matter um and so definitely um being able to connect your network if you have a, a network that produces revenue because of who's in your network connecting artists connecting entrepreneurs to your network yeah yeah nia how about you what what would you say to oprah and then other investors and those at different levels I would echo that. Um, Baltimore is a city that's spilling with talent like so many other cities, but we lack that infrastructure. Um, we lack a lot of resources. You know, a lot of other cities like Chicago, Atlanta, New York, they have people to advocate for them. They have all of these resources and, you know, that's what we need. So again, that financial support, someone putting their eyes on this city and um, there are many ways that you can set up grants here or that you can donate to funds, you can donate to do more to Muse 360 Arts, the Tendaya family. There are so many organizations here that need support. And again, just uh, putting a spotlight on artists and you know, opening up, looking at our city um, for artists to give them opportunities. There are so many opportunities, but Baltimore just kind of gets skipped over despite mm -hmm. having all of this amazing talent. So again, just echoing everything Slinks instead. Absolutely. We're going to make sure everyone gets all of your dot coms, your ads, all of those things so they can know how to support the organizations you're a part of. But to your point, as we think about holistically about the art, the art, um, all of the artists that are in our community, it is such a rich community of artists uh, and creatives. And so you're right, we have so much to do. Let me ask this question, which is um, posed to us by some of the young people watching with, which is knowing all that you know now, what advice would you give yourself starting out what's a kernel something you would say to yourself make sure your younger self gets to hear Slangston. work smarter not harder <laughs> because it's going to be hard but you actually don't have to make it as hard as it will be if you do these things here's a secret cheat code and lottery ticket <laughs> time travel lottery <laughs> ticket <laughs> Yeah, how about you? So how, how about you? Um, I would say trust the process. I was I was just talking about how like we think of all of these overnight success stories, but they're not really overnight because people have been doing this for years. You're just now seeing us. And there are a lot of things like a black girl's country. It took the Baltimore Museum of Art to see that film two years after it came out. And everybody I know who's been doing this has been doing it for years, 10 That's plus right. years in the game when they finally start to see the returns of it. So again, trust the process, like, and enjoy it, enjoy the ride. Um, you know, everything is gonna be okay. So that's that's my biggest piece. Yeah, no, the, you're so right. So many people get to see 
you and Nia, you Langston, and they're like, oh, now, I, you know, I'm get, getting to see that work. They don't realize all of the time, the complete journey that you both put in. Let me make sure we don't miss out on people understanding how to get in contact with you. So Nia, why don't you give us your Facebook, your your ads, your uh, face, um, your website, all that? Yeah, so my website is niajune.com. Um, NIA, June, like the month.com. Um, my Instagram is Nia June Poetry. So again, NIA, June, like the month, and then poetry, all one word. Twitter is the same. I don't really be on Twitter like that, but I do see you. If you're on Twitter, I check it. You know, I can still rap with you on there. And then uh, Facebook is also Nia June. And then once you go to my Instagram, I have a link tree. Donation options are in there. My latest work is always there. And um, I'm pretty responsive. I try my best to be, I don't want to say that. I try my best to be responsive, but I see most things. So, yep. Excellent, excellent. Thanks. How do we get in contact with you? Uh, DoMoreBaltimore.org. Um, on Instagram, do more at do more poetry. Um, my Instagram is artistalien777. Facebook and LinkedIn, I'm Victor Rogers. Um, those are the easiest ways. Um, and um, also we're gonna be doing poetry. Um, do more is on a show this Saturday at Avenue Market um, in collaboration with Wound Work Productions. Um, so we're gonna be doing some poetry there. And um, also too, definitely shout out to Kirby Griffin because you talk about artists and entrepreneurs in the scene who have been here for 10, plus, 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 plus years, all the way back to the hip hop clothing store that him and his father had, where they would sell artist CDs out of the store, mine included. Um, and then a super big mentor to shout out that connects so much to this conversation is, is my aunt who I mentioned before, who I, who I lived with when I went to Coppin, um, Stacy Rogers Ely, um, who, um, who is the chief executive director of Baltimore County, um, first black woman to ever hold that position. She, wow, one big thing she, wow. always, she always taught myself, my sister and my cousin, her son was about the business of life, which is when having your finances together in a way that it does not create more burdens for you. And that's a direct quote, is the business of life. And, um, and I definitely credit that to her. Excellent, excellent. It has been an absolute joy to have you both on. I'm gonna ask this last question come a couple of times what's next so what's the next big thing for you all both of you so what's the next thing for um Slankston, but also do more nia all of your work what's the next big thing we should look out for Slankston? so to, to talk briefly about next i have to put on my shambhala glasses with go ahead lenses, you can do it put um, them on. because while Slankston hughes is Slankston hughes victor rogers is many um, and so that is a thing that has been a part of my journey as well is that like I am also a, a hip hop artist, a musical artist working with live bands. And so um, me, Slanks and Hughes, and then also my twin cousins who are also my identical descendants and from the future, Lyrical Leviathan, Slick Viclo, and Thelonious Coltrane who channel through these glasses. Um, we're all releasing four different projects simultaneously, um, four different mixtapes at the same time. And so that is coming in 2000. 2022 to an internet near you. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Nia, how about you? I, we got, hold on. So hold on. How will we find out about these mixtapes when they come out? Follow all those places. Channel. Follow say. all the channels. Follow okay. All right. all right. Especially yeah. Artist Alien 777 on Instagram. Artist probably where I'm at Alien. Least. Okay. We'll make sure that gets in the, we'll make sure that gets in the chat. And so that people can see that when they come back on. Nia, how about you? What's, what's next? Um, so I mentioned next week, February 17th, I'll be showing my most recent documentary that I shot with Kirby Griffin um, at the center stage. The show starts at 630, I believe, but the information is on my Instagram. It's going to be a great show. You'll see artists like Lady Breon, who's also a part of Do More. You'll see Easy Jackson and a, a few others. It's going to be a wonderful show. So please, please, please come out to that. Um, and then I mentioned that I work with Muse 360 Arts with the organization called New Generation Scholars. We're starting a free educational platform that we'll be launching this month and we'll be offering a whole lot of different courses that are free to the youth, um, to any black person of all ages who wants to learn more about the African diaspora and wants to learn from artists like myself. So those Excellent. are the two things. 
<laughs> excellent, excellent. We will make sure we put them up and um, so everyone knows about them and can get, get in contact with both of you. First of all, let me just say thank you both uh, for being on Entrepreneurship Matters. Mm. You but more importantly, thank you for what you do. Um, both that gets seen and those things that you do that is not seen that really helps to promote, lift our community forward. Make a couple of announcements and then I'm gonna uh, sign off. Tune in next week to hear about all about public relations. We have two black men who are in the public relations field. Adrian Harpool and Everett Hamilton. You do not want to miss, you know those names. Um, follow us on JH Connects on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Thank you to our community partners, Johns Hopkins University, Johns Hopkins Health System, Hopkins Local, the Mayor's Office of Small Minority Women Owned Business, uh, Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses, and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Thank you both, Nia. Thank you, Victor. Oh, free youth poetry workshop with Enoch Pratt virtual this Saturday, too. Um, in our Pratt library, go to the main website. We All right, what time? Really what time? From uh, 3 15 to 4 30, something like that. And an okay. open mic at the end. Yeah, almost forgot about that. But yeah, nobody signed up yet, but sign up. People Don't worry, we'll put great. it out. We'll put it out for you. Excellent, excellent. We're getting so many comments. So thank you, thank you, thank you both. All right. You. You're welcome.